Anyan Seo. Who are we? And what is our nature? Every constitution, policy, and law is based on a theory of human nature. Answering who we are correctly is vital to the success of every democracy. The stakes are high. If we misjudge ourselves, we build governments and societies that crumble. If we're correct, we flourish. Together with my wife, Vanessa Woods, I wrote Survival of the Friendliest, which is about the lessons that other animals teach us about who we are as a species that are critical to democracy. We have been so overwhelmed by our positive reception here in Korea, so it's an honor to be here in person at the SBS Forum. I also want to share my condolences, my wife's condolences regarding the tragedy at Itaewon last weekend. We were inspired to write the book because of a popular misunderstanding about evolution that has really led to a lot of harm. When people think of evolution, they think of survival of the fittest. This phrase has been misconstrued for political purposes to mean that the biggest, the toughest, the strongest individual or group is somehow morally superior or more valuable to society. This thinking has been used to justify some of the history's most horrendous policies and political movements. But by fitness, Darwin and modern biologists, they only mean the ability to successfully reproduce. And in fact, if you step back and you look at all of life and you ask, what is the strategy across all life that consistently leads to the most success for a species or group of species? The answer is friendliness. Invariably, when a species or a class of organisms becomes dominant, it's because they evolved a new form of friendliness that leads to an increase in cooperation. The evidence surrounds us in nature. Flowering plants are among the newest form of plant life, yet they blanket the planet. Their success is thanks to the, their friendliness towards pollinators. Flowers provide a meal in exchange for help with fertilization. There's only one species of terrestrial vertebrate that can live in, in Antarctica all year round. It's emperor penguins, and they survive the brutal winter by hugging. Unlike most birds that value their personal space, these penguins are attracted to each other, and this allows for a new type of cooperation that results in warmth. Cleaner wrasse are a small reef fish, and they make their living cleaning the teeth of predatory fish. They're not just attracted to the predators, but they swim inside their mouths. Their unusual friendliness has led to a new type of cooperation. The cleaners are rewarded by a meal, and the predatory fish, they get their teeth cleaned of parasites. Repeatedly, we see in nature that when new forms of friendliness evolve, more cooperation follows that leads to huge leaps in success. My story begins with my childhood dog, Oreo. He was my best friend as a child, and Oreo and I, Oreo and I we loved to play fetch. So if I threw his ball and he couldn't find it, I would point to where it was hidden. It ends up this seemingly simple thing is a really big deal. After two decades of research, we know what Oreo was doing is something very special about dogs that make them very human-like. All humans, each of us in this room, learn to participate in culture and learn language by reasoning about what others are thinking. Humans have a special ability to think about what others feel, what they want, and what they believe. It's the basis of everything from language learning to morality. Understanding pointing is the first sign around nine to 12 months that a human infant is beginning to think about others in this new way. Could it be that our dogs, like Oreo, understand us like infants? 
We use a simple game to test this in infants, dogs, and other animals. We, we hide a treat or a toy in one of two places, and we point to where it is, where it's hidden. And what we found was that all types of dogs are very good at following all types of human gestures. They show this ability as young puppies, and they're more skilled than any primate, including bonobos and chimpanzees. To the surprise of many, dogs, our distant relative, are more human-like than our close chimpanzee relatives when it comes to cooperative communication. So of course, as a scientist, we wanted to understand where this unusual ability came from. To find out, I traveled to Siberia to work with a special population of friendly foxes. Starting in 1959, Dmitry Belayev and his colleagues selected a population of foxes to be friendly to humans. They started with a population of foxes with normal fear of humans. If you try to touch them, they would run away uh, and try to bite. But each year, they picked out the friendliest fox, who are the most attracted and least fearful of humans, and they bred them together. The experimental foxes became friendlier. Like the cleaner wrasse we met earlier, fear had been replaced by attraction. The friendlier foxes were so attracted, they wanted to be touched and held and hugged. The surprise was their bodies also changed. The friendly foxes were more likely to have curly tails, floppy ears, and they lost pigment in their hair. Even their canine teeth became smaller, and their muzzle or their face became shorter. These are many of the changes we think of as signs of domestication. When I tested the friendly foxes for their use of human gestures, they were as skilled as dogs, even though they were never selected for their communicative abilities. The control foxes looked like chimpanzees failing to use my gestures. So Belayev had discovered the essence of domestication is selection for friendliness. And that friendliness changed their minds and their bodies. The friendly foxes help explain why dogs evolved to be more human-like. Over 15,000 years ago, friendly wolves were at an advantage because they could approach and scavenge around human settlements. Natural selection favored these friendly wolves. Over generations, like the foxes, they evolved to be more cooperative and communicative with humans because they were friendlier. It's only in the past 150 years that most modern dog breeds, like Oreos, were under intentional selection by humans or artificial selection. The friendliest wolves domesticated themselves and became one of the most successful species on the planet, with millions of dogs living everywhere there are people, but sadly, only 100,000 or so wild wolves remain. This makes dogs exhibit A for the, how friendliness wins big in nature. It also suggested that other species may have evolved naturally through a similar process. Our first candidate was our less known closest primate relative. We have two closest primate relatives, bonobos and chimpanzees. We know that about a million years ago, bonobos and chimpanzees shared a common ancestor, but then the two populations, they split. Chimpanzees on the north side of the Congo River and bonobos on the south side. Over the past million years, Bonobo females, like Samindua, pictured here, decided that male aggression is no longer acceptable. Females became friendlier and formed alliances to stop male aggression. Bonobos evolved into a friendlier chimpanzee. On the left is a male chimpanzee. This male lives in societies that show human-like levels of lethal aggression. Groups of chimpanzees conduct warlike raids on each other, they murder each other, and they coerce females through male dominance. On the right is a bonobo male who lives in a society free of lethal aggression. No bonobo has ever been observed to kill another bonobo. Female friendships allow them to cooperate in a new way to prevent male aggression. If a male dares to attack a female or an infant, 
an entire coalition of females responds to repulse the male. Male aggression no longer pays dividends, with females even preferring to mate with the friendliest males. Just like dogs, selection for a friendlier nature has shaped how bonobos cooperate and communicate, too. In one cooperation test, we gave bonobos the chance to share food with another bonobo. Before they ate breakfast, in the morning, we gave them preferred fruit. They could either eat all the food, or they could use a one-way key to open a door on their left or on their right. Behind one door was a group mate, and behind another door was a complete stranger. Bonobos did not just share their food, but they also preferred to share their food with a stranger. Bonobos are xenophilic or attracted to strangers. Unlike chimpanzees who are xenophobic or fearful of strangers, bonobos have nothing to fear when they meet an unfamiliar bonobo. Instead, they have everything to gain, a new friend or ally. Here's what it looks like. This is Sake. She's a four-year-old infant living at Lola Ya Bonobo. We let her in with the yummy food, and you're going to see, instead of eating it, she's going to go open the door for her friend Alikia, and they have more fun eating together. So you'll see, sharing food is fun for bonobos. So again, with more friendliness, there we go, fun. With more friendliness evolves cooperation, uh, sorry, evolves cooperation that increases and pays big dividends. The most successful male bonobo have more offspring than the most successful alpha male chimpanzees. Friendliness wins again. What does this have anything to do with humans? We now know we were not alone on this planet until very recently. Just 100,000 years ago, we shared the planet with at least four to five other species of humans. All of these species had traits we typically think of as defining traits of our species. All the other humans had large brains, they had cultural traditions, and likely had linguistic abilities we would recognize. These are the traits we usually use to explain how we're different from other animals. But lots of other species had these traits, and they all went extinct. If we want to explain how our species became so successful, it must be something in addition to these traits that allowed us to thrive while all the other human species went extinct. It's then we realized friendliness is also the secret to our species' success. We have evolved a completely new type of social category, known as the in-group stranger. It's a person you have never met, but you immediately recognize as part of your group. So these are students at Duke University a bas at a basketball game, and it illustrates the power of our new form of friendliness. Our students come to Duke from all over the United States and all over the world. They meet for the first time on Duke's campus and they quickly learn to care about each other as if they're family. They all share one powerful identity, that of a Duke Blue Devil, which is our school nickname. No other species can do this. Only humans can meet a complete stranger and recognize them as a friend through shared identity. It is our superpower that makes us the friendliest species of human that ever evolved. It's also supercharged our culture and our technology. It's likely that other species of humans were highly xenophobic, like chimpanzees. And as illustrated here, different groups of humans would have had little interaction with other groups. So this means that over someone's entire lifespan, they would have only meet and interact with, say, 100 or 150 people in total. And that's going to really prevent the spread of innovation. Group identity and an attraction to those who share your identity, it changes the picture. It means that groups that share a language, a religion, a style of dress, or some other feature, they can interact to exchange ideas and innovation. While all species of humans had culture, 
our species culture took off with the appearance of the in-group stranger and group identity. Technological advances exploded as a larger network of minds connected, and our form of friendliness allowed us to cooperate and succeed where other human species could not. Like other animals, friendliness is seen in our bodies as well as our minds. Similar to the foxes, we have shorter face, faces. Our teeth are smaller. We lost the bony brow ridge seen in other human species. All changes that occur in other species being selected for friendliness. We also lost pigment, like many domesticated animals. In our case, we lost the pigment in our eyes. Every human, without exception, has white sclera. The circles are pupil and makes it easy to see where someone's looking. Every other primate uses pigment to hide their eyes. But humans, we advertise our friendliness and our cooperativeness with our visible eyes. Our brains use the presence of white sclera to subconsciously recognize another human. And it's the feature that babies first use to recognize another person. People are more likely to bond and cooperate when they see white sclera and they're visible. Again, we see a new form of friendliness evolved in humans that allowed the cooperation, enabling our species to thrive. Friendliness wins. Okay, but if we're the friendliest species of human to have evolved, how do we explain what we see in the news? Humans are capable of so much cruelty. Identifying the mechanism that allows us to be so friendly also helps us explain the paradox of human kindness and cruelty. I want you to think of a mother bear and her cubs. Nothing can warm the heart more as she cuddles, plays with, and nurtures her offspring. But at the same time, her deep love for her cubs is the same thing that makes her so extraordinarily dangerous. If her cubs are threatened, she's going to do horrific things to defend them. Humans are exactly the same, except we feel as strongly about our group identities as the mama bear feels about her offspring. We can be bonded and love those who share our identity as if they are family. And like a mama bear, if we feel our identity or those in our group are threatened, we will do horrible things to protect them. The same mechanism that allows us to think about what others feel that first begins to express itself as young infants begin following gestures is the one that shuts down as we feel our group identity is threatened. Instead of empathy for another group, we deny they have human minds and we morally exclude them. The worst forms of harm and cruelty follow. What I'm talking about is the potential for every human to deny humanity to other humans, also known as dehumanization. Every population that has been studied, a portion of subjects readily dehumanizes other groups of humans. In every culture and country studied, people show a similar pattern, whether rich, poor, men, women, liberal, conservative. Even young children have the potential to dehumanize. What is so frightening is the fact that a subject's tendency to dehumanize is strongly correlated with their acceptance of torture or violence towards the group dehumanized. People are most likely to dehumanize groups they feel threaten them. The biggest threat that is most likely to lead to dehumanization is if a group is told by a leader that their own group is being dehumanized by another group. Dehumanization leads to moral exclusion and it allows for the worst forms of human cruelty to express itself. It is because we love our identities so much that we are capable of so much cruelty. You can see this universal nature in the pattern of genocide that has been observed worldwide over the last 200 years. Mass murder has occurred on all continents. All humans have the potential for dehumanization and horrific cruelty. So given all we have learned about our nature from other animals and the power of friendliness, 
Can we engineer a friendlier future? I really see two major mechanisms. The first is democracy. And the second is thinking of society as a bouquet of flowers. So we did not evolve to be despots. Our hunter-gatherer ancestors lived without hierarchy for millions of years. It's only with agriculture that you see the first chief and military class that began monopolizing power. History shows that dictators can be overthrown, but until recently, the out-of-power group that took power from one group simply subjugated the group they overthrew. Despotism always replacing despotism. It's not until the liberal democracies of the past few hundred years that societies return to their egalitarian roots and now exist within hierarchies. In a liberal democracy, when a group is out of power, they still have power, and they still have all the same human rights as those in power. Peaceful transitions of power become possible. In rewriting our democracy, we have to find ways to immunize ourselves from the darker parts of our nature. And the good news is, we know how. We have all felt our identities are threatened at some point. You can likely think of examples of leaders encouraging feelings of threat and victimization that can quickly slide into dehumanization. To immunize against this, we must humanize and build shared identities. There are two well-established ways to do this that follow the pattern of friendship leading to new forms of cooperation. We must design our schools, work life, and our cities and governments to promote cross-group friendships. These are friendships that act like bridges between different groups, and they inoculate them from the worst of human nature. It becomes difficult to dehumanize and morally exclude other groups when members of your own group maintain true friendships with those from the other groups. Through these friendships, we can create interdependence. And interdependence occurs when would-be competitors realize they need to cooperate in order to succeed. When everyone's success depends on cooperation and each party realizes that the other group has something to offer, we humanize each other. To take advantage of our friendly nature and short-circuit our darker side, we must promote cross-group friendships and interdependence that then create a shared human identity. Like a bouquet of flowers, the whole is richer than the sum of the parts. If different identities are different types of flowers, when we put them together, they are at their greatest beauty. Their differences unite, they reach the highest beauty. I think we can build a friendlier future. And I leave you with these two unlikely friends as inspiration. If they can do it, come on, we can too. So what I would like to leave with you with is how you can help to rewrite democracy. In my humble opinion, the most important thing that we can do is find somebody you disagree with. Go to lunch with them and find a way to be friends. That includes politicians that are different from different parties and, be and become friends even though they disagree. It won't fix all of our problems but it will immunize us from the worst part of our nature. Thank you, and I welcome your questions in the remaining time. Thank you. 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 
예, 말씀해 주시겠어요? Oh, I've learned so much. I feel inspired. I, I, I have uh, more hope than I arrived with. <웃음> 생각보다도 많은 것들이 우리 박사님을 놀라게 한것 같습니다. 무엇보다도 네. 이 관객 속에 앉아 계신 여러분들의 다정함이 박사님께도 전해지지 않았나 이런 생각해 봅니다. 저희가 지금 강연 들으면서 현장에서 취합한 질문들이 꽤 여러 가지가 있는데요. 하나씩 하나씩 한번 드려 보도록 하죠. 네. 먼저 제가 소개를 해 드릴까요? 네. 처음처럼 님께서 보내 주신 질문입니다. 읽어 드리겠습니다. 아, 박사님의 책 다정한 것이 살아남는다로 학생들과 함께 독서 토론을 몇 차례 한 학교 선생님입니다. 다정함도 학습이 가능할까에 대한 박사님의 생각을 한번더 듣고 싶습니다. 라고 전해주셨네요. <웃음> 아, um, yes. So I think that friendliness can be learned or trained and, and what's nice is that by seeing our evolutionary history, we know that our species loves to be friendly to strangers, loves to teach other people about our identity or share our identities with others. Um, and of course, you can then use culture and learning to even increase that. Um, and so if you grow up in a society that's open and people are excited about learning about uh, others that are different or um, you know, maybe uh, unusual for your experience, um, then that will lead to more exchange of ideas and um, people, um, you know, effectively celebrating any kind of differences as just human differences. 네. 네, 맞습니다. 교육의 현장에서 다정함이 소재로 쓰인다면 훨씬 더그 효과가 클것 같다는 생각을 다시 한번 해보게 됩니다. 맞습니다. 자 그러면 다음 질문 이어가 보도록 하겠습니다. 어, 굉장히 재미있는 질문이 들어왔습니다. 박사님의 한국어판 책을 직접 편집한 분이 보내주신 질문 저희가 드려보도록 하겠습니다. 김진형 씨의 질문인데요. <웃음> <웃음> 이 편집을 하면서 책에서 굉장히 많은 위로와 감동을 받았다고 먼저 감사의 말씀부터 전했습니다. 자 질문 보죠. 안타깝게도 보노보는 착륙하지 않고 워낙에 전쟁을 싫어하는 그 본성 때문에 다정한 존재인 까닭에 현재 멸종 위기 중에 처한 게 아닌가 이렇게 생각을 하는데요. 보노보가 진화의 승자가 되길 바랍니다만 현실은 전혀 그렇지 못한 것 같습니다. 이에 대한 박사님의 생각을 듣고 싶네요라고 보내 주셨어요. Yes. Okay. So um, all uh, non-human great apes Gorillas, orangutans, chimpanzees, bonobos, our closest living primate relatives, they're all endangered uh, due to human activity. Uh, bonobos uh, are very successful though uh, as a species. They live in an area south of the Congo River that is three times the size of France. Um, and there's still a large enough population in the wild where if we care, oh. no. Uh, they can be saved. I personally work with Lola Ya Bonobo, mm -hmm. which is an organization that saves and rescues orphan bonobos, like Sake in the video. <laughs> and they rescue them, and then we release them back to the wild. So there are people working hard mm -hmm. to protect bonobos because they have so much to teach us. If we look to nature with humility, we can see that Bonobos, other animals, uh, they really can't help us. Mm -hmm. 네. 우리가 Bonobo 추상적으로 에게. 가질 수 있는 그런 개념들을 mm -hmm. 이렇게 직접적인 사례와 실험을 통해서 전해 주시니까 훨씬 더 이해하기가 쉬웠던 것 같습니다. 네. 네. 마찬가지로 이번 질문도 앞선 질문과 좀 연결이 되는 것 같은데요. 네. 다음 질문 읽어 드리겠습니다. 아, 정세진 님께서 보내 주신 질문입니다. 다정한 늑재들은 왜 지금의 개보다는 적게 남았을까요? 굳이 우위를 따지자면 같은 종에게 다정한 것보다 다른 종에게 다정한 점이 더 생존에 유리한 걸까요? 라고 물어오셨네요. Ah, okay. So why do we have... Um, uh, I believe the question was why... Are wolves still aggressive, um, and how have they 
evolved, given that they are only friendly with their own species. Um, and so there are still wolves in the wild, thankfully. Um, and wolves have taught us what's special about dogs. Um, so we have, uh, you know, wolves to thank us to understand how friendly dogs are. Um, but it's not that wolves are always unfriendly. Um, they have their family, and they're actually incredibly cooperative. It's just with humans, they, they're afraid. And even I have helped uh, raise, and my team has helped raise, dozens of uh, wolf puppies. And even if you raise a wolf puppy, they are, when they grow up, they are afraid of you. And they would prefer to be with other wolves. Whereas if you raise a dog from puppies, they want to be with people. They mm. love people. Mm. So dogs have evolved to really want to be with us if we raise them. Whereas wolves, if you, even if you raise a wolf and you do everything its mom would do, as soon as it gets four or five months old, it just wants to be with other wolves. Mm. Mm. 늑대 중에 사람에게 다정한 늑대들이 개가 되어 더 번성을 했다. 그런데 늑대는 그 잔인함을 버리지 않았기 때문에 소수만 살아남았다. 어, 같은 종에게 즉 늑대 무리 안에서 다정한 것보다 인간이라는 다, 다른 종에게 다정했던 늑대만 개가 되어 살아남았으니 종을 초월한 다정함이 생존에 더 유리한 것일까라는 질문이었거든요. 아, yes, yes, yes. So the the secret to dog success is that some wolves were attracted to people, just like the cleaner wrasse are attracted to the mouth of a predator. Some wolves were attracted to people because there was food around human settlements, and it was easy to find and very reliable. And those wolves were at a huge advantage. But then natural selection acted on their friendliness. They started to breed together. A friendlier species was born. So yes, in that case, friendliness is a huge advantage. 네. 이런 점이 아까 강연에서 잠깐 언급하셨던 우리가 알고 있던 전통적인 개념의 적자 생존과 다른 개념이라는 걸 다시 한번 느끼게 되네요. 맞습니다. 네, 현직님께서 보내주신 질문 바로 이어가 보도록 하겠습니다. 우리가 더 나은 삶과 더욱 강한 민주주의를 위해서 다정함을 조금 더 의도적으로 추구할 수 있는 방법으로는 어떤 게 있다고 보십니까? Yeah, so I, how, to, how to pursue friendliness. So I was very serious at the end of the talk about going to lunch. So for an example, I have uh, one of my students. He is a staffer for a, a senator in the United States. And I met with him and I said, have you ever been to lunch with someone who's from the other party? And he said, no. And I said, why have you not been to lunch with somebody from the other party? And he said, why would I go to lunch with them? <laughs> I said, to be friends? <laughs> and so eventually he went to lunch with someone who was from the other party who does his job uh, for this other senator. And it ends up they became very good friends. Mm. And they became friends with, all their friends became friends. And now they write bills together. 네, 강연 중에 그 농구팀의 예를 들어주시기도 했는데요 그만큼 인그룹의 어, 의미가 더 강조되는 부분이 아닌가 싶네요 네. 자, 다음 질문 보죠 아마도 마지막 질문이 되지 않을까 싶은데요 시간 네네. 관계상 이형준 님께서 보내주신 질문 읽어드리겠습니다 네. 아, 비인간 동물 중에 아, 민주주의를 가장 잘 이해하고 가장 잘 작동시킬 수 있는 동물은 어떤 걸까요? 라고 <웃음> 네, 호기심 넘치는 그런 질문이 들어왔네요. <웃음> 인간이 아닌 존재 중에 음. 말이죠. Oh, wow. 네. The best species for democracy. <웃음> 네. Interesting. Well, uh, it would be species, and there are many species that have uh, more egalitarian social systems. Some species are very despotic and have hierarchy. Other species are very egalitarian. Mm -hmm. uh, bonobos uh, are an example, but the, there's another species of primate called the muriqui that lives in Brazil, completely egalitarian, and everyone's equal. Oh. <laughs> uh, so it really is in nature. There are some species that are very equal and fair and 
Yeah. Oh. Could be very good at democracy. 네. <웃음> 어떤 속성이 있는지 찾아봐야겠네요. 네. 맞습니다. I'm not, 네. I'm, I'm not sure about dog. <웃음> 네. 네. 사실 관객 저희가 여러분의, 네. 관객 여러분의 여러 같은 성원에 힘입어서 <웃음> 질문을 하나만 더 소화를 좀 해볼까요? 네, 네, 시간을 조금 더 제작진과 얘기해서 늘리도록 하겠습니다. 네, 이번에는 그러면 MJ님께서 보내주신 질문을 드려볼까 하는데요. 전쟁 같은 외부 환경적인 요인이 우리를 도무지 다정하게 만들 수 음. 없을 때 음. 그런 상황에서 우리는 어떻게 대처해야 할까요? 아. Uh, if war can stop us from being friendly, Well, history teaches that cross-group friendships, that friendships across different groups, even in groups that uh, are at war, that those cross-group friendships are the bridges that lead to peace and reconciliation. Um, so again, I can't emphasize enough, if we want to have a friendlier future, mm -mm -mm. then start making friends with people you disagree with. 음, 음. 저는 사실 오늘 박사님의 강연 중에서 음. 한 사람 한 사람이 모여서 꽃다발과 같은 그런 사회를 이룩해 나간다 이 표현이 정말 마음에 들고 가슴에 와닿는데요 이 인간이 가지고 있는 아. 공격성과 같은 그런 부정적 또 어두운 네. 그런 면모를 외로움 이 이겨낼 수 있는 음. 다정함과 또 교류를 통해서 극복해 나간다면 정말 꽃다발과 같은 사회를 우리가 만들어낼 수 있지 않을까 그런 생각을 네. 다시 해봅니다 어, 그리고 다정함과 또 잔인함이라는 두 가지 측면을 우리가 가지고 있다는 것을 잊지 않으면서 말이죠. 네. 자, SDF 2022 다시 쓰는 민주주의 여정의 끝을 맺는 연사로서 우리 박사님이 수고를 해주셨는데요. 네. 소감과 더불어 다정한 끝인사 부탁드리겠습니다. Friendliness wins. Come sum it up. <웃음> 오늘의 핵심 주제였습니다. 네. 아, 우리 박사님과의 사인회가 밖에 마련이 돼 있으니까 오늘 많은 참여 부탁드립니다. 박사님 다시 한번 감사합니다. 감사합니다.